were sitting here and suddenly this huge elephant appears in the bush behind us just just a few meters away from us this is the largest uh, this is the largest animal in Africa it is well known for its aggression it has killed many people I have to sneeze guys the smoke is going in my nose <laughs> It's amazing that uh, you use the creation account and uh, it's the first angel's message. And I don't think the opposition that you received is so much because of the movie or because of the creation account. And I don't even think the opposition to my person was because of the creation issue itself. Uh, it's what comes after it. The second angel's message and the third angel's message make for very uncomfortable relationships with those that are, well, ensconced in that message. And that is why in an age of ecumenism and an age of political correctness, uh, people tend to distance themselves from that aspect of the message. And unfortunately, the baby and the bathwater get thrown out together. So if, you're, if you just concentrate on the first angel and just concentrate on the creation, that would be fine. Mm. But if you take it a step further, well, then it becomes problematic. But I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm happy that uh, the world saw that movie. I'm happy that they realized we do have a creator God. But you know what? We have more than just a creator God. We have a God who also has a government. And that government experienced major problems. And there was a rebellion in heaven. And the rebellion was a twofold rebellion. It was a rebellion against the authority of God and the one in whom it was embodied. It was a rebellion against Jesus Christ and it was a rebellion against his law, against his seat of government. And that brings about another message. When you worship God as the creator, you automatically also worship him as the God of the Sabbath. And you made it a point in your movie to bring across the idea that creation is not just six days, it's seven days. That is true. And the seventh day is the one that embodies his authority and it's encased, ensconced in the commandment, the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day. And once you understand the conflict between good and evil, then you understand that the conflict is against the law. So the creation movie is a tremendous stepping stone of taking people further. And if you take them further, then you have to go into the character of Christ. You have to go into 
the character of God, you have to go into the basis of his government, you have to go into the causes of the rebellion, and who are the instigators and the custodians of the rebellion today? See, this is very important just saying that every production that one do creates questions. Yes. Naturally. People would like to know more about it. And that leads to something else. That's it. And people worth saying, and I even asked myself the question, what's next? So it cannot stay with creation. That's the point, Henry. Oh. It cannot stay with creation because it has to come to a climax regarding the basis of the government of God, the centrality of Christ, the position of law and grace. Those have to be added. And so we had an opportunity after that to work together on, on many other productions. And uh, uh, you had a production called The Rebellion. That is true. And that came quite at a later stage. In the beginning, when all these questions were asked of people coming to the Creation Project, they naturally wanted to know if they haven't seen any of your other productions, who is that person? Because he's bold enough to speak on stage like 35 to 60 minutes on a topic that was unheard so far and stir them up. Well, who is the person? And I thought to myself, I would like to introduce part of your life in a documentary. And so we gave you a call and you were just finishing up some of the uh, presentations that you did here in South Africa. And then we came to pick you up and we went on an exciting tour to a number of African countries, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and so on. And you dragged my car, which was a pretty <laughs> new car, <laughs> <laughs> through the rivers, totally <laughs> inundated it with uh, the worst experiences that it could possibly have, but somehow we survived it all, yeah. and out of it came the production Africa Continent of Origin. What do you, what do you personally think about the idea of going across that river? Not a good idea. Why is that? Because it's way too deep. I think it's it is. much deeper than my air intake. And if it sucks in air, my engine's gone. Hmm. Decisions, decisions. This river crossing is exceedingly deep. And my vehicle's in air intake is, is not that high. It doesn't have a snorkel. Do we go across or do we take the long way around 110 kilometers of sandy soil, which is very hard on the engine, very poor roads, where you could get stuck as well, many times maybe. What are we going to do? And that's Andre, very confident as always. I don't know if the insurance will cover this, but we should make it. And just before we went through here, another vehicle got stuck. Another 4x4 four four vehicle. And, uh, well, do we risk it with a very expensive car? Decisions, decisions. Well, what did we do? Yes, with continent of origins, of course, it's very tongue-in-cheek, yeah, right? It, yes. it was just like a, a, a hook, a, hook. a little hook with a piece of that's bait it. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking to you about the concept of the production, I knew your life has changed a lot, very much so, coming from an atheist to a believer. Not only that, coming from a very interesting field that is very important to so many people and now ending up as someone who speaks against it and needs to bring the arguments 
And how does one do that? All right, let me ask you a question. Aren't we moving into a time slot in history where the message of the second angel and the message of the third angel and the message of worship God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, that that should be made prominent in the time that we are living in. Absolutely. What do you think about we should release them on Clash of Minds? What do you think? I think it would be a good idea. Let's release them and see if we can make them available. And who knows? Maybe God, in his wisdom and in his almighty power, will make it available to more than 100 million people. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, love to. Nikana re ka uja re o kopane tse ne bone re papa tsa re bolela re bolela mahati ya ka re tsebe What you are seeing here is the soul of Africa uri hilesulo I grew up in Africa I was born in Africa raised in Africa and Africa gets into your blood There's no way that you can ever get rid of it. You can take someone out of Africa, but you cannot take Africa out of anyone. Okay, to me, this I'm okay. Everybody on this planet has a yearning for something and everybody longs for a restoration of that which we cannot define. Africa is a place that shows a pulse which you find nowhere else in the world. Here in this often arid world, in this world of contrast, you find masses and herds of creatures that that bring out something in humanity that nothing else can do. This is a lesson book of nature. The earth is a witness that God has written his character into every single animal on this planet. There 
is absolutely nothing that can beat an African sunset. When that sun sets and the sky is reddened and a herd of, of giraffe walk by with that graceful step, that speaks to the soul and tells us there's a creator God that cares about every single detail. And if he cares about every single detail, how much more so would he care about you? See, Africa is so dear to my heart. And I always thought, you know, if you do a production and you're adding B-roll and have some shots of the African wildlife, the nature and all that, fantastic, people love that because it's exotic. It's a fantastic continent. But there are other places that are equally interesting. Let me just, let me just say something here to the audience. Uh, you know, when, when these big companies like the BBC go out and they shoot nature programs, they have such a huge team and they have so much money to do these things. And they have so much time. Sometimes it takes them years to put together these nature programs. And they're beautiful programs. But the, the narrative that goes along with the program, of course, is anything but to the glory of God. It's always to the glory of man. And the, the philosophy that is ensconced in those productions, using nature as the drawing card, is of such a nature that you are divorced from God and divorced from the concept that there is a creator God. So here was, a, here was a mechanism to use that same nature. Now, you don't have those funds. You don't have that time. You don't have those production teams. But you have something that they do not have. And that is called prayer. And so you would get up before sunrise, prepare the cameras, say to God, we are going into the field now, and Lord, we need situations and we need environment and we need things to develop in such a way that they can have as great an impact or greater impact than what these great, great companies in the world can achieve. He loves our trees. Wow. 
were sitting here and suddenly this huge elephant appears in the bush behind us just just a few meters away from us this is the largest uh, this is the largest animal in Africa it is well known for its aggression it has killed many people This elephant is only 15 to 20 meters away from us. We're sitting here around the campfire and he's this close. He's got huge tusks, he's a big animal. What a privilege. You can hear the bark and the the wood crushing between his massive molars. Let me light the doors, rely on elephant droppings, and they clean up the environment and make sure that, or the eggs that they lay in the dung, that they hatch and produce the larva which eat uh, the maggots of the flies which are in dung. That was quite an experience. That was a huge African elephant. And when he passed by us, he went in the direction of our vehicles and he passed within one meter of our vehicles. And then he moved down to the camp further down and uh, we were able to get these marvelous shots comparing him to the size of their vehicles. He was huge. And when you look at this giant animal and you think about its origins, and you think that people believe that he's related to the rock hyrax as its nearest living relative, then you really have to have a lot of imagination. The interesting thing is, of course, that fits in with the evolutionary paradigm that animals develop from small to large. But if you look at the, the elephants and you go back in time and you find the giant mastodons, which were much larger than the elephant, and they pushed these creatures millions of years into the past, but if you go to the permafrost in Siberia and in Alaska, then these creatures are frozen in time. I had the privilege of going to Alaska and uh, walking in that particular area. And when there is a thaw, you can smell these animals because they're still rotting. Are they really millions and millions of years old? If they are still in a state where even the dogs can eat their flesh. And then it is not surprising that many people across the globe want to come to this place to experience the African harp throb. And when they come here, they always want to see the Big Five. But what if the fairy tale is true? Well, to every rational mind, we might have to admit it does sound like a fairy tale. Is it really so 
that there is a God of love out there? Is it really so that He cares so much that He became man, suffered the consequence of every travesty of justice that can be imagined by man? And if, if you've ever been on one of these, these trips or ever been associated with one of these events where you're working basically on your knees, you will be surprised to see how God brings the scenes together and provides the, the information that you stand astounded. There is no way that any one of us, Henry, could take credit because... God is just amazing how he does it, right? Unbelievable. Most of the people in Africa call it a game drive. And a game drive means simply it's a game, whether you're going to discover the animals you're searching for or possibly not. It's a matter of luck, some people would say, I would say, no, it's a matter of a blessing. To be here among these wonderful nature, the beautiful trees, the bird sounds you may hear in the background, and of course you hear the wildlife. You not only hear it, you'll see it. It is just all over the place. And being here several times before, it has been a great experience. But this trip was beyond expectation. We have seen an abundance of that wildlife beyond every of my imagination. When you come out of that, you are, you are filled with the idea. You are not dealing with some vain philosophy. You are dealing with a living entity. You are dealing with a God that cares about every single person and wants them to realize that there is a God and he wants to bring them back into harmony with his will. And what better than you can tell these people that there is a God out there who cares, yes. a loving God who created them. You know, and people would just go out into these national parks and the places and say, oh, how beautiful that is. And then you see a production of such as BBC millions of years ago. Yes. And you know how much that hurts? That's yes. nonsense, it's really. Such a, so, such, a, such a lie, such yes. a blatant lie. And they're so educated on this issue. Yeah. But the Bible calls those that negate God fools. What a privilege to have traveled up the Chobe River with the highest concentration of elephants in the world and to see these massive animals with their little ones swimming across the river to reach those lush grasslands on the island separating Namibia from Botswana and the, the care they take to keep that 
little one afloat. Those giant animals standing there, halfway submerged in the water, chewing away, eating this grass, and how they have learned to slash it and smash it into the water so that all the sand grains should be removed to protect their molars. Because they only have these six sets, and thereafter, there's nothing to replace them. And so they are, they are careful how they use them. these abilities, are they evolution or are they capacities that were built into that system from the very beginning? That brain that has to cope with all these environmental conditions, is it a, a feature of design or is it a chance feature that developed over millions and millions of years? Well, what an interesting morning. One of our vehicles followed a lion sighting, and since we had special oh, licenses fine. to go right up close to these animals, one of the vehicles went in to photograph the lions at close quarters. We were sitting there waiting, and suddenly we heard a loud pop, like a cracker going off, and we wondered, what was that? And when the vehicle came back, we saw that it was limping on one side because a bone had gone through one of the tires and punctured it. And so we had no choice. We had to change the wheel, but the lions were right there. That was quite an experience. What to do? Wait till the lions go away. They could stay there all day and we had to move on. So we decided to change the tire. And of course, this is quite a process. It's soft sand. You just can't just put a jack underneath. So we used the airlift. But as we were getting out and gingerly checking out the area, the lioness came in between the bushes and she was crouching there looking at us. 
just a few meters away. Do we continue or do we get into the cars and wait? Now, the normal thing when you face lions is you're supposed to stand up and look them straight in the face. So I stood there and we looked them in the face and after a little while she moved sideways and back into the bushes and we changed the wheel not knowing what was happening. It's a very exciting place with a lot of adrenaline when you live in Africa. finger right inside. We have to bring a message to the world. Tell them about Iceland. See, God is always in time. And years ago, I was flown back from Brazil. And uh, I had a stopover in Switzerland. Coming back for an event where we shared 300,000 DVDs to all the students, teachers, and professors of the country. 300,000 DVDs of the creation movie. Short version of the General Conference. Three hundred thousand copies of these beautiful creation videos to be given into the homes of students all over this division. And we are going to see God's blessing through this project. E nós seremos as bênçãos de Deus através deste projeto. It's the foundation of everything we believe in. É o alicerce. When we say we are Seventh Day Adventists, we believe in the creation by God. We are not evolutionists. We are not theistic evolutionists. We are creationists. We are Seventh Day Adventists. Nós somos adventistas do sétimo dia. And on my way back to Switzerland, I was picked up by a friend of mine, Christian Ströck. He got me to his office. He was the secretary of the Swiss Union. There are good people in the church, oh, right? Yes. Not everybody is no. in opposition. Let's make that clear. No, very good people. If there is opposition, there is also support. 
very much. And we must never, never lose heart. We must never get to the point where we say that the entire church or the entire leadership is against the three angels' message and its proclamation. There are good people in this church that are willing to stick their neck out. Amen. Amen. And I said to him, well, I'm thinking about a new production. He said, what is it? Oh, I wish I could produce the three angels' message. As you just announced, you know, one step further. What's it's got, next? It's got to go further. Go it can't further. stay there. That's it. Nature is great. Creation is awesome. God has provided, but he asked us in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, there is more to come. And so I said to him, I would love to produce the three angels' message on the, one of the most amazing soils on planet Earth. I said, what is it? I said, Iceland. Now you chose Iceland because of the desolation. Because ruggedness. Ruggedness yeah. and Abusos rebellion, everything that's is it, sort of in the character me. in the yes. soil, really. And I thought that would be a great place. I wasn't sure what I was talking there, but it was a vision. It was an idea of doing it. And years later, a couple years later, really, I, uh, I gave you a call. And I said, Walter, where are you? I said, I'm in Canada right now. And you're on your way back to South Africa. Yes. yes. And I said, would you mind doing a stopover? Where to? I said, uh, Iceland. <laughs> what? What do you want in Iceland? It's cold. You always, it's cold. I said, you know, as a South African, it is cold. But I said, would, I would like to shoot a, a film, a documentary with you uh, in Iceland because I've read the book, The Story of Redemption. And it touched my heart. And I learned about the character of Satan, how he was described, about his cruel things and everything. And I didn't have to, I just saw the pictures in my head. I didn't have much of a content when it comes to the message, but I know that is your responsibility. And you said, yes, I can imagine to do that. I could do a stopover for a few days. Now, you must just realize that uh, throughout all of these years, I had a full-time job at the university. So the only times that were available were always when there was a university break. And everything had to slot into that. And it's amazing how God actually did that and how those days that you need are available and that everything falls into place. This is absolutely supernatural. Mm. If you think back over the years how God provided not only the information but the time slots and the ability and the, the whole ambiance to get it together, it's amazing. Yeah. It's miraculous. Yeah. And, and we wanted to take parts of it, bringing from the creation into the story of redemption to tell about the beauty that God created and the things that Satan destroyed. And I wanted to make a production based on the story of redemption, but even sort of acting, which I don't think is really appropriate, but we needed to show a bit of the character, how it might have been, although being thousands of years later. So you don't want it to be Hollywood, you no, want it to no. be truth, but just plant the seed. That is it. So I talked to a good friend of mine who is Elias the other son, living in Iceland, and his two children. And uh, I said, well, could you imagine that we film that production and use you as Lucifer? He said, well, a strange question. I said, well, sorry, but you look good. I mean, in terms of like you could fit in that role. And he said, well, I could imagine. Now, the funny thing about that is I only realized during that time that we were filming parts of a production before we went to Iceland and used that as a material of creation. That means we were at the same setups of nature, exactly to the same situations we shot before, and returned to the very same places to record a totally different story. And that's what we did. We went there, took the equipment, and it was kind of difficult because you maybe remember the chair that we took along. It was a red chair. A red chair. It was more like a sofa. And I had that idea, Iceland is rugged, it's 
an unbelievable country, but having a red chair sitting somewhere on the black soil would make such an impact. You don't see it too often, but it's there. It's going throughout the whole production. And the children of Israel. And there was a good king who would introduce the principles of God, the law, the Torah, the word. And so we were taking that chair, it was kind of heavy, to lift it up and bring it up a hill, remember? Up the mountain. Up the mountain, carrying it up there to place it right there. And God just provided awesome light. And you know what the production was that we were there before? The yeah. second production of the newly created creation movie. I went there with Moses and Gerson, with his so-called son. And... The character is an, is an old evangelical person that I have met. He said, yes, I would love to be part of that production. And we came along and it was the harshest summer ever. It was July and we had like four degrees during shooting days. It was so cold. It was unbelievable. And he was freezing. And so he said, Henry, shoot quicker. I'm freezing. <laughs> so how can I shoot quicker? It's in frames per second you're shooting. You can't go quicker than that. It doesn't make sense. And so we filmed at certain locations and we returned with you to the very same spot.
And within these four days of production time we had, we shot the amount we could. And you were so exhausted coming from Canada with the jet lag. And we, we went on a walk and that very first walk, it was the day of your arrival. I had an idea in my heart. I wanted to share with you. You shall be the first to know about that. And I took you along on a walk, said, hey, do you have the power to go? You said, yes. And I shared with you the idea of moving to Sweden. I said, do you think that's a good idea? And you said, I think it is, because I give you some background information and you acknowledge that that would be a good idea. Because that is an, what do you call it, an uncalled field? Yes, an unentered field. An unentered field. But looking back to what once happened there. Eh? Yes, it had such an interesting history. Yeah. It was once a bastion of Protestantism. And today it is a, well, a secular state. With, very atheistic. With very atheistic leanings, That's yes. It. But we had the impression we should go there. And I wanted to share the idea with you, what do you think about that? And I came back relieved, ready now to film this production. And we went out there shooting in the midst of this desert, of these rugged places. The wind blew, we set the chair, we started the camera and together we filmed a production called The Rebellion. What a spectacular place it is. We're here in Iceland. Looking back there, this awesome sunset in the West Fjord of this island. Reminding me on the beauty of creation. Everything surrounding me is unbelievable. Beyond imagination. What a place this is. We have come here to record a highly important message. Imagine John sitting on the island of Patmos about 2,000 years ago and writing this story down as he was inspired by Jesus Christ himself. And he wrote in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the so-called three angels message. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel for those that dwell on the earth. To every nation, kindred, tongue and people, what a message this is. A message for you and a message for me. We have come here to Iceland already 11 years ago, almost at the very same spot, looking at almost the same situation with an incredible sunset, one of many. But this time we came with a red chair, together with Professor Walter Feit who has come here to share a message with you of high importance, a message for every person on planet Earth. It is the message of three angels flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the Earth. That red chair is a symbol to the importance of this message for the project called The Earth Between Light and Darkness. And that is exactly what we're seeing here. The earth between light and darkness. What's next on planet Earth? Where are we heading? What does the future hold? Where are we standing today? And what about hope and future and perspectives? We would like you to also sit down and listen to this highly important message. The earth between light and darkness. All heaven must have been watching because here was the opportunity for the other party to approach the jury. Would they take the bait or would they resist? Heaven was watching. There must have been an awesome silence.
And when her hand reached out and took the fruit, I can imagine the faces of the angels as they watched in disbelief. Is this possible? Is this really true? Is it possible to convince that God is not what he appeared to be? Surely she wouldn't take the fruit. This was the stage for the solution to the great drama that had taken place in heaven. And God came with a very specific solution, a very specific promise. And he addressed the serpent and he said, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall crush thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Let's put it this way, for people who do not really have a, a great concept of, of what really happened in the history of redemption, what really happened in that rebellion that started in heaven, it is a, it is a, a tool to present to people so that they can share it and bring people to understand it so that they can understand the next step and the next step and then finally to the third angel's message. Mm. So later we shot the three angels' messages in their fullness, right? That's right. We shot the three angels' message, we shot the rebellion and there's even another documentary coming out with all the other footage collected on different places. And of course we used cameras like that, we used photography, we used the drone, and I remember one occasion, it was the very last day, I sent out Walter into the field and his ruggedness, no people whatsoever, and it was a beautiful afternoon light, and I flew the drone and I saw you on the monitor, and all of a sudden you disappeared. And I saw you laying down there. I said, Walter, is everything fine? Hey, 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 it's all good. And then you went up and you hurt your ankle. You see, the whole of Iceland, being volcanic, has many, many uh, holes in it and caverns under. And some people have disappeared, never to have been found. Yeah. And I had to walk along this uh, lava field and all of a sudden the ground just gave way and my one leg went in and came out rather twisted. <laughs> but we shot everything. We shot we, everything. And we even shot the final scenes. We finished everything in time God provided and we said, that is it, we've got it in the box. And I, I went home on crutches. You went home on crutches. And you were coming along with some gear. Yes. What happened was uh, I had managed to get hold of some equipment that we brought to Africa to start our own studio. And uh, that equipment was necessary, so there were cameras and uh, I had a lot of hand luggage and I brought back a jib. Now a jib is one of those cranes that you attach cameras to so that you can swing it around. And this thing is very, very heavy. And we were sweating bullets because how am I going to get all this luggage and then to Africa? And then you still said, stop over in Iceland with all this luggage. 
Now that stressed me out completely because if I had to go to Iceland, then I would have to rebook this equipment on the next flight from Reykjavik to South Africa. So how was I going to do that? Because it was a major problem. And uh, the, I had so much overweight that it was going to cost a fortune. Probably more like a ticket. Oh yes, more, like, more than a ticket. Yes. So we prayed about it. And in Canada, we were standing there, sweating bullets. I, of course, had a normal ticket. And all of this luggage and this stuff is incredibly heavy. That one, uh, that jib alone was two suitcases, what, two, one and a half, two meters long. Long ones that had to go into special luggage. And as we were standing there in, in Canada at the airport in Vancouver, uh, they made an announcement. They said, anyone who wants to upgrade to first class can. And uh, it's a very special offer. I think it was something like $100 or something mm -hmm. Canadian. They can upgrade to first class. Because, because the normal classes were filled, eh? Hey? Yes, the yeah. normal classes were filled. And so we inquired, is that possible? And they said, yes, that of course doubles your luggage. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And so the, in Canada, they never even weighed it. No. It just weighed straight through. And I said, whew, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And we, we got to Iceland. We, I had jet lag. We shot that, uh, that whole scene. During the recording, we had a short break and you fell asleep. And we crawled out, making sure you I was you sitting get in, in that chair. You were sitting in, in the, the field chair. and I fell During asleep. During the recording, you fell asleep. Well, I had such jet lag. Oh, yes, it was amazing. Yeah. He's awake. Did I fall asleep? Yes, you did. <laughs> That's good. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So the everlasting gospel must once again be revived. The whole world must be lightened with the glory of these messages. I ask you to join me.
And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. I am a Seventh-day Adventist, not because I believe that we are better than anyone else. I am merely a Seventh-day Adventist because of the biblical criteria which point to that church. And I am a Protestant. I am a Lutheran of Lutherans. I am a Methodist of Methodists. I am a Calvinist of Calvinists. But I keep the commandments of God and I cling to the faith of Jesus. I ask you to join me. And we had no scripts. Yeah, no scripts. Uh, people don't understand how that works, and I don't understand how it works, and you don't no. understand no. how it works. And if, if you believe in God, then uh, you might still not understand how it works, but it works, yeah. right? Should we enlighten the Clash of Minds viewers on what happened right after we pressed stop, after recording the three angels' message in the chair? You got a phone call from home, from Sonica. <laughs> That's right. Uh, just then when uh, we finished the recording, my wife phoned and uh, the baboons had trashed our house. They had broken into the windows, they had uh, broken the taps and the water was running. The whole house was underwater because <laughs> uh, everything was floating. They had jumped across the rafters, they had smeared their... Uh, manure all over the place. They had broken everything in the cupboards. They would sit on the beds. They would tear open with their teeth the milk uh, cartons, the, the juice cartons. They would urinate, defecate on the beds. We had to take, you couldn't even wash it. It stank like crazy. Mm. You had to take all of that out. and We threw all our linen away. We had to take the carpets to be cleaned. We had to get the place cleaned out. It was such a mess. The devil was furious. I was just finishing and packing up and I heard some steps as you came back and I heard someone crying and screaming. And you said, Henry, I would like to show you something. And you presented to me your phone. Sonica, live, video, talking to you. And you said simply to me, Henry, this is an indication that we did the right thing. We did the Satan right thing. Satan is furious. And my foot was swollen like ah. a watermelon. And uh, you managed to get me a, th a physiotherapist That's who it. did some treatment. But yeah. I went home on crutches. Yeah. And I got to the airport and at Reykjavik. And the person who was book checking me in said, what is this luggage? And I said, well, I have to take it through. She says, no way, you're not taking that. It's not happening. It's way too much luggage. And I said, but I have to take it. I, I don't know how to take it. She said, put it on the scale. And it was <laughs> way off. She said, forget it. You're not traveling with that. And as she was saying that, the power went off. Now, that's Europe. The power went off at the airport. It that happens very rarely. Very rarely. So the power went off. She was so frustrated trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And after a little while, everybody had to wait. The power came on so she could redo her computer. And she says, this luggage can't go through. And she was trying to work out you know, how many thousands I would have to pay if it went through this way. And power went off and it didn't come on <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> and so they couldn't weigh it they couldn't do the ticket they could do nothing with it and so the next thing that happened she says well i can't deal with it it went through and i paid nothing it went through 
And then I was in the aeroplane and I was thinking about it. Now, of course, it was checked through all the way to South Africa. But I knew in South Africa there would be another problem. Because there I would have to check out in Johannesburg and then check it back in on the flight to where I lived in Hootsprate, which is a small plane, and I knew they weren't going to take it. There was no way they were going to take my luggage. And I was sweating bullets, how am I going to do this now? <laughs> so I was thinking I will have to put it in storage somewhere yeah. or get someone to take it away from the airport, phone someone, and then drive the 600 kilometers back from where I was, pick it up by car, and then take it through. So it was going to be a big schlep. And I had this hand luggage with camera equipment. And in crutches. It. And I was on crutches. And I had bags to drag with one leg. And finally we landed. And I went to pick up my luggage. And there was no luggage. And I waited and I waited and I waited. And there was no luggage. And so I went to the people and I said, uh, I have to catch my next plane. There's, there's no, my luggage isn't here. No, they'd lost the luggage, all of it, everything. Now I had the, the hand luggage, which had the camera base, but all the lenses and everything else was, was in my suitcase. So this was, and of course those big bags, they were, they were just not there. And so they took the numbers and they took the, the, the information of my dockets and they said, fly, we'll see if your luggage pitches up at some stage. And so I flew back home, and about three days later, they phoned me, your luggage has arrived. <laughs> Here. <laughs> In its spray. Yes. Imagine, imagine. So, so again, I didn't have to check it through, because it was their problem, they'd lost the luggage. No extra payment whatsoever. No extra payment, nothing, it went right through, and I picked it up. The bags were broken. Mm. Uh, they were strapped with tape, but there was nothing missing, absolutely nothing missing, and mm. it was amazing. That's a blessing. So it just shows how God works. You have your problems, you have your disasters, but that information cannot lie on a shelf. It has to go out you to must. the people. You must. And a new documentary will come. It will be shown on Clash of Minds. I'm working on it. I also work on other productions that, in fact we did together while Francois was with us, Francois Duplessis. Um, we shot that one in Africa at Hippopool and did an amazing production there. It's a document, well actually it's, it's about 20 episodes of um, a scientific view onto Patrick's and Prophets chapter two. Uh -huh. And it's called The Ultimate, will come soon. Well, so. my Henry, it was very good talking to you on all of these issues. So here you were, a little boy, and you had a dream to go to Australia. And instead of living in Australia, you live in Sweden now. <laughs> that is true. Somewhere there in the little forest with your trees around you. And you know that uh, we are living in the last days. And God said, if you can, get out into the country. You listen to that call. We have to, Walter. This is so important, the you times listen, we're living in. You listen to all those little calls. And on the way, God took a big hammer and a big chisel. And he said, Henry, there are a couple of things that are going to change. Those stakes, they have to go. <laughs> you know what happened? You want to know? Yeah, what happened? I came home from that trip of Africa after meeting you. Two, three days after Hartenbosch, I flew out. I landed in Germany. I went back to my normal life. I went back to my stake. And it was that evening when I went to a Turkish shop where they have kosher meat, and I bought this beautiful piece of, of meat. And I couldn't wait for it to eat it. And at that evening, I took one piece after the other, as I normally did. I drank coffee, 14 cups a day, a day. I ate meat like... I remember you had headaches like crazy, oh. and I told you, Henry, the reason why you have headaches is because you drink that stupid mm. coffee. Yeah. And, and you gave me often treatments and helped me to overcome, but 
I just continued on with this coffee. 14 cups a day. Being in the graphics business, you just think, you don't think, you drink. And that was impossible. And then the meat. And that night, I went to bed after eating that stuff. And about 11 o'clock, my chest started beating and lifting like never before. And it went worse and worse and worse. My heart, I heard my heart bumping. I heard everything out of my body and I screamed out because I thought I'm going to die. It was worse than the experience in Africa. And I said, Lord, remember, I was doing worship for hours a day. But that thing still got me. And I said, Lord, Lord, you must help me. And I give you another promise. If you help me, I, was, I went and ran to, to the bathroom. I had to vomit. I don't know how many times until blood came. It didn't stop until that prayer. I said, Lord, if you help me, I will stop eating meat tonight. That's it. And no more coffee on top. Healed. You Never can't... again I ever drank one coffee. Never again I ate meat. 2006 in April. We have a holistic message. It embraces not only the mind. It embraces your very being, your soul, and it embraces your body. And uh, that is what the Bible tells us, that we are the temple of the living God, mm. and that we should be very careful as to what we put into that temple. How do we treat ourselves? And once you start understanding how God put us together, because it's not just a question of he created us. He created us to be in the image of God. That means you must have the same mindset. He gave us a body that is so finely tuned. That means it must have the right fuel. So if you want to have a healthy body, then that will lead to a healthy mind. If you have a healthy mind, that will lead to a spiritual experience. It's a holistic message. It works together, absolutely. And therefore we cannot separate one portion of the message from the other. We cannot say, all right, we're interested in this, we'll push this to the neglect of another. It's a beautiful message that we have. And in every person's life, there are stages when God reveals truth. And we are stubborn. We have a rebellious nature. And God brings about the situation where you come to the point where you realize, if I don't change now, I might just lose that spirit that whispers into my ear. And uh, everybody had it. Paul had it. Jesus confronted it and said, Paul, how often, how long do you want to kick against the pricks? Because that Holy Spirit will prick you and prick you and prick you and you might kick against those pricks. But eventually, we all have to have a Damascus experience. We have to. There's no way around. You had one in Africa and you were instantly healed. You had another one when it dealt with your personal lifestyle. God changed the way in which you live and the way in which you react. Remember the prayer in 2008, and God answered, and he changed my totally business structure yes. within a couple of months. Yes. So this is how God works. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't mean that we won't have adversity. But I would encourage people to persevere. Trust in the Lord your God. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. That is Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Those are my, my mascot verses, as it were. Henry, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this discussion. I hope that people will realize that... Uh, once we make a decision to follow God, and once we promise to do it, we shouldn't kick against the pricks, but go with the direction that God shows us. So here I grew up in this, in this country. I was an evolutionist. I didn't believe in God and all I saw 
was what you see. But somehow it is dislocated from you. It is separate from you. It is like being in a movie and you're seeing things that have transpired. But if you know that God actually created all of this,